I'm going to tell you a little bit about what my group has been doing in the context of using machine learning to accelerate discovery in transition metal chemistry uh, and for materials. Uh, and this is a pretty brief, um, brief uh, uh, speaking slot. So I wanted to get to kind of the heart of the matter in a few minutes, but maybe perhaps this is the first time you're hearing me me talk about uh, how my group uses machine learning. So I wanted to give you a brief overview in case you, you're not familiar with our work. Um, what we do is we aim to do chemical discovery in challenging material spaces, which typically refers to transition metal complexes with open shell transition metal centers, as well as metal organic frameworks. So usually we start at a point where we need to do some degree of data generation, and my group develops a code known as MolSimplify, which automates the generation of data for transition metal complexes in chemistry. Things that are pretty straightforward in organic chemistry tend to break down for transition metal chemistry. So we've developed tools that take a divide and conquer approach there to allow us to overcome some of those limitations. Then we also have spent a fair amount of time thinking about in the context of transition metal chemistry, the optimal molecular representation is a little bit different than it is for organic molecules because the properties are heavily dictated by what goes on at the metal center. I'll tell you a little bit about that. So usually once we have some sort of data set source that we generate as well as molecular representations, we train machine learning models, which includes artificial neural networks. And we've also spent a lot of time thinking about how do we know when a machine learning model is predictive or not? So how do we quantify uncertainty? We've developed new uncertainty metrics, uh, including the uh, distance and latent space, as well as using feature space distances to understand how do we quantify uncertainty from machine learning models. I will talk about work that uses those UQ metrics, but I will not describe those UQ metrics today in the interest of time. So once we have this framework where we have a machine learning model, we've generated data, um, we've trained it uh, to predict properties of open shell transition metal complexes. We can either exploit the model, say, to predict uh, spin crossover properties or to predict redox potential, or we can do model exploration where we use something like expected improvement and we go out and we look in areas that are promising, but for which we're data poor, and then we retrain our models. And our goal at the end of all of this, besides just developing fun tools, is to discover new design principles and new uh, materials that are predictive from a purely computational perspective of, of things that could be realized uh, experimentally someday. Um, and so we have to keep in mind not just model uncertainty, but uh, DFT method uncertainty. So hopefully I'll get a chance to touch upon a few recent applications from my group uh, that cut across all of these, these themes today. But this is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, some of the things that we focus on doing. Uh, so when we first got into this, one of our earliest focuses was thinking about how do you represent a transition metal complex to a machine learning model when you're relatively data poor. So we tend to work in the regime of only having a few thousand transition metal complexes, as opposed to the hundreds of thousands of organic molecule points that many people work with in small molecule organic chemistry machine learning. And so the first time we did this, we used a series of ad hoc descriptors that essentially encoded what I thought I knew about a transition metal complex. And this approach actually worked pretty well. Um, but it was very metal local and it was very heuristic in nature. And there are many properties such as the atomization energy that people spend a lot of time uh, thinking about machine learning that depend much more on the global shape of, of a molecule or the number of atoms in a molecule than our metal local feature uh, set uh, had included. So we went back and did this in a much more systematic way. And by developing these representations, it allowed us to work both with neural nets that essentially carry out their own feature engineering, as well as more lightweight models such as kernel ridge regression models. And so what we did was we extended something that had been introduced previously known as moreau brado order correlation functions. And because we extended them for transition metal chemistry, we refer to them as revised autocorrelations or RACs. RACs are properties and dis different properties that are products and differences on the molecular graph. So we define uh, no geometric information, but we have an adjustable depth, D, and something that makes them particularly tailored for transition metal chemistries. We either focus in on the metal or on the ligand and then count bonds out from those uh, focus points. 
And so um, everything that's in MCDL25, which is a feature set that worked pretty well that I'll show you on the next slide, uh, can be mapped to a revised autocorrelation function. So for instance, the metal center identity is the same as the zero depth uh, metal center Z rack. Um, and the five properties we work with most commonly are the nuclear charge, electronegativity, covalent radius, topology, and identity. And we can code them separately as either more electronic in nature or more geometric in nature. We can also say certain racks encode information proximal to the metal versus distal to the metal. And um, all of this has analysis of the most essential features identified through recurrence of feature addition has been a useful way for us to develop these maps of which properties matter most in materials. And so typically what we do is we come up with these pie charts where if the pie charts are a lot of um, blue, red, and green, that indicates that as a very metal local feature. This is after recursive feature addition in a KRR model. Whereas if we see a lot more gray in this pie chart, like I'm showing here for redox, uh, then that's a much more metal non-local feature. So what these two pie charts should show you is that you could design the spin of a transition metal complex uh, while not changing its redox potential and vice versa. So this gives us opportunities for orthogonal design. So we're big fans of these pie charts. Um, we like them a lot, uh, but you might be thinking, well, um, when we do this approach, what we're doing is we're training models to predict DFT uh, level properties. And we know that DFT is not particularly accurate for transition metal chemistry. So one of the things um, we wanted to do was assess how sensitive this is, and I'll come back to this in a couple of slides, assess how sensitive these pie charts are to where the data comes from. Uh, but this is just to show you what this performance that we typically get looks like. This is not using any geometric information, and this is on data set sizes that are only about 1,000 points. Uh, so doing this the ad hoc way, we got a mean unsigned error of around two and a half kilocals per mole. When we use racks, especially these feature selected subsets, which is what the blue and green bars are, we're able to achieve about one kilocal per mole accuracy on a relatively uh, small, uh, low dimensional feature set. Um, and this extends to predicting other properties like redox and ionization potential, um, and the trends are consistent. This also allows us to do some neat things because we don't provide the geometry to the model. The model can actually predict metal ligand bond lengths, and it can do this in a spin and oxidation state dependent manner that's more accurate than off the shelf force fields like the metal ligand, uh, like the UFF force field. And so as a result, we can take a divide and conquer approach where we predict uh, the organic bits of a transition complex with a conventional force field, but then assign metal ligand bond lengths and we'll simplify using our neural net. Um, and so you might ask, well, what's the difference between the ad hoc feature set and these feature selected subsets? Well, this is how metal local our MCDL25 was. It had a lot of metal proximal features. Rack 155, just by nature of the enumeration, that's the full rack set to a depth of three. Um, by default, it has a lot of metal distal information in it. When we apply feature selection to get the best property prediction models, you can see that the uh, MCDL25 and URAC26 agree consistently that metal distal information indeed doesn't matter and is counterproductive for predicting transition metal complex properties. Where the two differ and why one gets an accuracy of about one kilocal per mole, while the other gets an accuracy of about two and a half kilocals per mole, is in this balance between proximal and middle uh, information. And I would say that's just because we lacked creativity in thinking about how to encode this mid-range information. Um, so back to the pie charts I mentioned, this is a pie chart you see for uh, BLIP, which is a GGA functional, it's pretty low cost to, to use, but it's not one that we particularly think of as being accurate for transition metal complex properties. And what this pie chart is telling us is that predicting the spin splitting between the high spin and low spin states is a very metal local feature. Um, and then if we go to other properties, such as the homo-lumo gap evaluated with uh, the delta SCF method, you can see things get much more non-local. Same thing goes with the vertical ionization potential. Um, so these are properties we normally think of as being, in terms of their raw prediction, very sensitive uh, to the functional chosen. So we might move over to, say, a more highly parameterized functional like M06L and expect a different result. Um, but what you can see is that the shapes of the pie charts differ more 
uh, between rows, between different properties than they do by different functionals. And we can go even to something like M062X, which has a very high amount of Hartree-Fock exchange. So it's very different from these other two pure functionals. And we still see the same result. And we can even move to something we think should be more accurate, like a double hybrid, like PB0 double hybrid. And you can see consistently across the row, these pie charts remain the same, even when we know the functionals themselves would disagree. So this gives us not just uh, faster property prediction models based on data we don't necessarily trust from DFT, but this gives us through this feature analysis, a way to see uh, which features matter most in property prediction in a way that's universal and is invariant uh, to where the data came from. So we could develop these pie charts with, say, something cheap like uh, VLIP GGA, and then apply them uh, to go out and decide which double hybrid calculations we're willing to carry out. Um, so how can we use this to accelerate design in a way that doesn't uh, hinder us and, and force us to lead, uh, always carry out design with a single density functional? So that's what's typically done in high throughput screening is we start with one density functional and we go and find out which materials that one density functional uh, likes the most. Um, but instead, what we'd like to do is we'd like to use this knowledge of uh, 23 different neural networks trained on all the DFAs we compared in the study. So I just showed you four, but in fact, we compared 23 across all rungs of Jacob's Ladder. And over 187,000 transition mal complex design space, um, we could ask ourselves how much do different density functionals agree or disagree about properties. So here I've colored um, these points by, so first of all, they're showing the points in the latent space of the model. The models are all fine tuned, so they all have relatively similar latent spaces, but they're trained to predict the properties of 23 different density functionals. And large standard deviations means the different functionals disagree a fair amount. And you can see most of those points are more in the, the mid range for uh, what I'm gonna show you now is spin crossover complexes. So spin crossover complexes have near degenerate high spin and low spin states, and they're among the trickiest things to try to predict uh, from a density functional. And so if we require that at least half of the density functionals agree, there's no guarantee that that particular region of chemical space is one where they'll all be more predictive, but it means that changing the functional won't change our answer as much. And so if we look instead at what a single functional would tell us makes a good spin crossover complex, it's a much larger portion of the space. Uh, but if we then look at what makes an experimental spin crossover complex, what you can see is that there's much better overlap between the consensus um, ML model. So we require that 12 of the DFAs agree. Um, then there would be if we had instead gotten a lot of false positives from the single um, ML model. And so this allows us to then uh, propose that an example spin crossover complex that all the consensus ML models would predict would be something like uh, cobalt with nitrogen atoms, because all the DFAs predict these to have spin crossover characteristics, even though they haven't uh, shown up yet in experiments. And we can make these types of uh, predictions because we're saying these are spaces where um, all density functionals would agree. It's not just an artifact of a single DFA. Um, so an example where we try to instead address uh, multiple objectives and not just a single property um, is one that we, we looked at uh, recently in terms of trying to figure out what does it take to make a better uh, redox couple for redox blow batteries. And so typically what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to maximize um, the solubility in a nonpolar aqueous electrolyte. We want to maximize redox potential and we want to avoid uh, crossover. Um, and so we want stable materials that are big and bulky and resistant to crossover and are made of building blocks that experimentalists can easily make. Um, but we also want to satisfy these other objectives. Uh, so the way we address this multi-objective challenge where we really think uh, ML models for property prediction can shine is we first started by building a large candidate pool consisting of heterocycles that are common in a lot of different uh, known structures, say from the Cambridge Structural Database or from other materials people frequently study. We fuse them together uh, to form 700 or so core ligands that we then functionalize. You can imagine uh, functionalizing these ligands can tune their solubility and their redox potential. 
Um, especially if we modulate the size, I just told you several times that redox potential is strongly size dependent. Um, and then we wanted to look at several earth abundant metals that had been relatively underexplored for redox couple design and redox flow batteries. Typically vanadium is the gold standard. Vanadium is not such a bad metal to work with, but we wanted to expand our palette and, and look at what we could see if we looked at these other metals as well. Combining all of these produces around 2.8 million uh, bulky transition metal complexes. They're all homoleptic and should be readily synthesizable. But I'd like to point out these all have around 100 to 200 atoms. Um, and so they're really much bigger than anything that you would conventionally want to carry out a lot of DFT calculations on. You wouldn't want to carry out 2.8 million DFT geometry optimizations of uh, systems that had 100 to 200 atoms in size. And we also couldn't rely on some large data set of prior calculations we might have carried out that were on that scale. Um, so what we did was we did a model exploration approach where we combined the uncertainty quantification metrics I mentioned at the start of my talk uh, with uh, 2D expected improvement and an efficient global optimization algorithm uh, to go out and explore. And so what this looks like in a 2D expected improvement approach is that we're going to put something that is a measure of solubility specifically for us that's log P. Um, and then we're going to put redox potential on the other axis. And what we're going to do is we're going to go out and generate as much DFT data as we can, can handle generating in a couple of weeks' time. We're going to use that data to go ahead and train a neural network. And we're going to ask the neural network, what do you think of 3 million data points? The neural network is going to be varying degrees of reliable across the space because we've only sparsely populated with some data. Um, and what we're specifically looking to do is we're looking to push forward points beyond the Pareto front. And so we're going to then take all of the points the neural network thinks are going to push, push beyond the uh, Pareto front, as well as taking into account the uncertainty. So how much will these points give new information to our model? Uh, this gives us a 2D expected improvement score. Uh, we're going to pick from here several candidates to go back and uh, generate new DFT data. Um, and the neural network is going to be right or wrong about some of these points to a certain degree, but we can then retrain the neural net uh, and start over. So I've shown you the cartoon, but this is what it looks like on real data. Um, so after about two weeks time running 64 GPUs in parallel, so one GPU per calculation, about 64 calculations, this is how many calculations we get. Um, this is so sparse in part because of attrition, which is a subject of a different talk I'm not gonna talk about today um, in terms of how do, you, how do you address challenges of attrition and transition metal complex um, geometry optimization and in open shell calculations in general. But this is what we got. So this is the properties of around a hundred points uh, that we got after about two weeks. Um, and this is what we get from the neural net in a few minutes when we ask it, well, what do you think of this space and where is our expected improvement highest? So high expected improvement scores light up this frontier with this bright yellow. Um, and so this is our Pareto front shown on both graphs here and we're looking to move past it. Uh, so we see a series of points that the neural net predicts will move past that uh, Pareto front. And we in turn then uh, go back to DFT. And after about another week with DFT, we see that some of those points do in fact move the Pareto front and forward, but the neural net was not that smart about the space. Um, and so a fair number of the points don't move it forward, uh, but we can go back to the neural net and ask and retrain it, ask it again, what do you think about the space? Um, and we can see we do a lot better this time. So we've found several points that move the Pareto front forward and we go back to the neural net again for a few minutes, back to DFT for another week um, until this starts to saturate. There's a limited payoff in terms of how much further we can push this forward in the design space. And so after about six weeks with DFT and 15 minutes with the neural net, we reach a, a conclusion of, of getting um, our Pareto front much further. So all the Pareto frontier compounds come from the last couple of generations of this optimization. 
Um, and they all have pretty convergent design principles. So if our focus is really on maximizing the redox potential while not sacrificing solubility, the optimal choices should be these manganese high spin complexes with oxygen coordinating atoms, sulfur in the ring and small polar groups. Uh, the small polar groups we probably could have guessed before when I told you redox potential strongly size dependent, uh, these other design elements we couldn't have possibly known. So we can ask ourselves, well, how much better is this than if we just gone out and brute force random search the space? Um, and a conservative estimate uh, reveals that we had at least 500 fold acceleration. And at first that number might sound kind of disappointing. You know, anyone can do something 500 times faster these days until you realize that it took us six weeks of highly parallelized DFT to reach this point. And so this is really the difference between having an answer to a design challenge in a month versus not in our lifetimes. And as we add more and more objectives, this will only serve uh, to accelerate further and further. This acceleration is multiplicative. So I'd like to finish by talking about how we're starting to think about which other design objectives we'd like to satisfy in challenging material spaces where the simulation, no matter how many density functionals we throw at it, the simulation may not be good enough. And that uh, is best exemplified by metal organic frameworks. Uh, so metal organic frameworks, uh, when we first got into this, were pretty widely featureized for machine learning models with geometric features, because a lot of the focus has been on gas uptake and separations. And you can think about most of what matters in predicting gas uptake and separations is the size and shape of the pore in the metal organic framework. So we were curious if racks uh, could be good features for MOFs. And so we took advantage of the fact that people who work in MOF chemistry focus on domains of MOFs. So they focus on the metal uh, secondary building unit, the linkers that link together those metal secondary building units, um, and functional groups that show up on the linkers. So we divided our rack scope, just like we have metal-centered and ligand-centered racks, we divided them into metal-centered uh, SPU racks and linker racks and so on. And we added them to these typical poor geometry features. And indeed, we found that um, adding them to even simple models improves the predictive capabilities of models. And we can do the pie charts for these types of features, just like I just showed you the pie charts for predicting transition metal complex properties. And what we can see is that uh, pink, green, and purple uh, contributions to the pie chart means that chemistry matters. And so we see some intuitive trends, for instance, that like, uh, CO2 uh, it uptake is more dependent on uh, chemistry than methane is because methane is a much more symmetrical, just blob-like molecule where CO2 is, forms much more directional interactions. And as we increase the pressure uh, for uptake of these gases and MOFs, we can see that the role of chemistry in the um, predicting properties disappears. When we're just shoving a lot of these molecules into the pores, the pore geometry indeed takes over as the most important um, property to make these uh, predictions on. Um, but sort of a challenging aspect of this uh, that we encountered while doing these studies is the observation that um, if we do this feature selection analysis on different data sets, we reach different conclusions. And so we reach different conclusions about the extent to which um, metal chemistry in particular matters. And so what was interesting was if we do this on a data set known as the core MOF data set, which consists of experimentally characterized MOFs that have been cleaned up for computation, we find a strong dependence on metal chemistry, but when we work with these hypothetical data sets that people have constructed, um, we don't get this metal dependence. So we wanted to know why that was, what's so different about hypothetical MOFs that people uh, typically study versus experimental MOFs. And so I'm showing you a few t sneeze here. The main thing to note is that if data shows up as gray, that means that that's a uh, structure that's present in the experimental data set, but not present in hypothetical data sets. And you can see that you see the most gray in this metal chemistry uh, uh, a projection. And in particular, there are lots of types of metal SBUs that are present in experimental data sets that were absent in hypothetical data sets. And so our property prediction models can't predict that metal chemistry matters because they're simply not sampling sufficient diversity. Um, and so we wanted to go back and specifically work with these experimental data sets, the CORMOF database, and figure out, well, what can we learn from these types of data sets 
that we can't learn um, when we work with hypothetical data sets. And, and the main thing uh, to note is that an observation from this also is that hypothetical sets should at least have the same level of diversity that's been achieved experimentally, uh, not the other way around. Um, so we know that even though uh, these experimental data sets are on the scale of about 10,000 MOFs and they're smaller than hypothetical MOFs, they're still quite large. And so thousands of MOFs have been experimentally characterized, um, but the challenge with using all of this data is that everyone has a different name for their favorite MOF, and there's not a consistent place where all this data is deposited, which means that we actually have to figure out a way uh, to get this data out of the literature and map properties from the literature uh, to MOF structures. Um, and so what we did was we developed a natural language processing pipeline um, and we mapped all the structures that were deposited uh, with clear structures, mapped their associated properties in each manuscript. And the specific properties we focused on were ones that are widely studied. One is, can you activate a MOF, which means can you pull the solvent molecules out of the MOF and clear its pores for gas storage or catalysis? And the other was, uh, thermal stability, which gets characterized by a, a thermogravimetric analysis. So what temperature does the MOF break down at? Um, and so we could develop machine learning models directly on these experimental observables. And then we could analyze what the machine learning models were telling us. So first of all, we could predict uh, with good accuracy if a, if a MOF would be stable with respect to activation. We could also predict the temperature at which the MOF would break down. Um, and you can see that these two properties are pretty consistent, so it's really hard to de design a MOF to be stable with respect to activation and not also be thermally stable. And this also allowed us to take our models and with uncertainty predict new properties of, of previously unseen MOFs, so we could make predictions in minutes of over 1500 uh, uh, MOFs, uh, predict their uh, temperature breakdown and whether or not they'd be uh, stable with respect to solvent removal. This is orders of magnitude faster now than carrying out the equivalent experiment. It's not, um, it's not something that we would readily be able to simulate to be able to predict either of these quantities. Um, and most importantly, we can take these models and then go out and figure out what does it take to make a MOF more stable? How do we engineer it to be more stable? And so, for instance, we can look at MOFs that have low activation stability and think about how changing the metal centers could, uh, won't be enough to increase the stability, or only slightly increase the stability. But if we want to increase solvent stability, we could instead change the linker chemistry because our uh, feature analysis showed us linker chemistry is really important. And so in doing so, if we get rid of the, um, of the methoxy groups and um, we can increase solvent stability and it doesn't really matter what the metal center is, uh, but changing the metal center in combination with uh, increasing, with, with changing these linkers also allows us to slightly increase the thermal stability. Um, and we can do the same thing to focus on increasing thermal stability for relatively unstable MOFs just by, say, fluorinating the linkers. Um, and so a lot of the conclusions that came out of this work were that a lot of chemistry done on the linkers can change the MOF properties a lot more than was previously understood through heuristics. Um, so I think I'm about out of time, but I'd just like to point out that all of our models are available on our website, MOF Simplify. You can play with it. You can actually, um, if, especially hopefully if you're an experimentalist, you can actually rate our models predictions and tell us what you think of them. Uh, you can download a, a series of data. You can look at where this point falls in our data set and, and so on. Um, and you can also check out more about the interface on this archive paper here. So I'd just like to finish up by saying, um, I gave you a, a long story in a, in a short amount of time about how we've built up tools for high throughput uh, transition mount chemistry, which naturally led us to building uh, the first machine learning property prediction models for open shell transition mount chemistry. Just predicting faster is not enough. We've focused a lot on accelerating discovery and revealing design rules. Um, we'll simplify and a lot of our machine learning models are available online as well as on content and GitHub. And I'd like to take my last minute uh, to acknowledge the, the students who did the work. Uh, the Mole Simplify work was started by Timmy Anidis, my first PhD student. The machine learning work was started by John Paul Janay, 
uh, my PhD student who graduated a couple of years ago and is now at AstraZeneca. A lot of this work was done by Dr. Fang Lu, who also spoke earlier in the symposium and is now a tenure track assistant professor at Emory in chemistry, as well as uh, some current group members who've done a lot of the impressive work I've had a chance to tell you about today, including Adit Janandi, uh, Chen Rudwan, Naveen Arunachalam, Gianmarco uh, Taronis, and, and David Kastner. And I'm 